We are back live in Los Angeles with our final segment of our live coverage today from the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books on the campus of UCLA. Now joining us is Roxana Saberi. You just saw her on a panel on the Middle East, and she is here to talk about her book, Between Two Worlds, My Life in Captivity in Iran. Roxana Sabiri, how long did you live in Iran before you were arrested? I lived there about six years, and I was just getting ready to leave the country to move on to the next chapter of my life when I was arrested. Well, you were raised in Fargo, North Dakota. How, why did you move to Tehran? My father is Iranian, and um, I wanted to learn more about the Iranian culture and society. I didn't grow up speaking the Farsi language at home because my mother was Japanese, and their mutual language was English. So I thought the best way to, to learn the language would be to immerse myself in the country. And also I wanted to be a foreign news correspondent, and I thought what country would be more exciting than Iran where there would be news stories for years to come. You were arrested in January 2009, but you had been there six years, yes. and you lost your press pass in 2006. Yes. What, what kept you there at that point? Well, and why did um, you lose your press pass? Um, they never gave me a clear reason for um, taking away my press pass. But um, at the time, I wanted, I believed that there was a greater need than ever for independent news from Iran, and I felt a responsibility to help provide it. So I continued reporting, but on a limited basis that was allowed by law. And I also found that I had a lot more time and actually a new opportunity to write a book about the country. And I wanted to tell stories of different Iranians in various sectors of Iranian society for outsiders, for people outside the country that went beyond the headlines, beyond what you could tell in a short one to two minute news report. Tell us about that morning in January 2009. I was asleep at nine in the morning when the doorbell rang to my apartment and I got up, crossed the living room and saw in the monitor in the living room that there was a man standing outside and he said, Khanam is Saberi, it means Miss Saberi. I said, yes. He said, you have a letter. So I thought it must be the mailman, and I buzzed him in. And then he came up, and I opened the door to my apartment a crack. When he arrived, he handed a slip of paper to me through the crack. And I thought, this is very strange, because usually it wasn't even an envelope. It wasn't a letter. And usually the mailman didn't do that. So I started reading the paper, and it was all written in Farsi. But those two words that jumped out at me were Evan Prison, the most notorious prison in Iran. He pushed his way in, uh, and then behind him came three other plainclothes men. I could tell that they were intelligence agents. And they started rummaging through all my belongings, confiscating books, my laptop, my cell phone. Um, they said I couldn't call for help, obviously. These men also could have been armed, I thought, so I couldn't scream to see if my neighbors might help. They said, we're going to take you elsewhere for questioning, and if you cooperate, we'll bring you back home tonight. But if not, we're going to take you to Evan Prison. And what did they mean by cooperate? Well, I learned over the next several hours, they took me to an unmarked building elsewhere in the capital city of Tehran and questioned me about various things, but the focus of their questions were the, on the book that I was writing. And they said, for example, why did you interview so many people? They said, I had interviewed a wide range of Iranians, the young, the old, the rich, the poor, and so on. And I said, well, I needed a good cross-section of society to show some balance. In, in this book. I can't interview just five people and say that they represent the whole society. And they said, who paid you to write this book? I said, nobody's paying me. I don't even have a publisher, so I didn't have an advance, and I'm, I'm paying for this out of my own pocket. They said, does anybody have a copy? And I said, yes, my mother does, because I would email her copies of my chapters, and they didn't like that at all. And um, they knew that I was going to leave the country soon and publish the book overseas. And they seem to not like that at all either, because in Iran, if, if you want to work on a book, you don't need government permission, but if you want to publish it in Iran, you do, and oftentimes it gets censored in the process. So apparently, they didn't like the fact that I could publish it elsewhere where they wouldn't censor it. But the main um, goal that they had through all these questions I learned over these hours was that I was supposed to say that my book was a cover for espionage for the United States. And it wasn't, of course, it wasn't. Um, and I, I knew that the Iranian authorities often um, falsely accuse independent-minded people or, or critics of, of being um, spies. But I kept telling them it's not a cover for anything, it's just a book. Just read it. You have my computer. 
And they said, we don't believe you. It's too bad you didn't cooperate. Now we'll have to take you to Evan Prison. How long were you there? Evan Prison? A total of 100 days. What was the worst day of your life there? I think there were a, a, a few really bad days. Um, and it was mostly when I was in solitary confinement for two weeks in the beginning of my imprisonment. Nobody saw me being taken from my apartment by these four men. I wasn't allowed to tell my family where I was. Um, I was allowed to make one phone call, but then I was told to lie to them about where I was and, and why I'd been arrested. And who did you call? Um, wh when I was allowed to call my family, they said, tell your father that you have been arrested for alcohol, which wasn't true, and that you don't know where you are. And he should remain quiet. He shouldn't tell anyone. But you'll, you'll be fine. You'll be freed in a day or two. And so I was relaying this message to my father over the telephone with in, this, English. In, in, in English, with a tall intelligence agent standing over me, making sure that I followed through on his orders. Um, and I was trying to give hints to my father that I'm lying to you. This is not true. But uh, he didn't quite get it. So it was in solitary confinement that it was most difficult because I, I realized the history of Evan Prison. Many political prisoners were held there. Zahra Kazemi, the Iranian-Canadian journalist, had been held there in 2003, and she mis mysteriously died a few days later, and no one was ever held accountable for her death. And also, they pressured me to make this false confession about using my book as a cover for espionage. And they threatened me in many ways. And eventually, I succumbed to their pressures and that's a horrible feeling when you abandon your principles um, that you think you'll always hold true even under pressure. And you told them you work for the CIA? I told them what they wanted to hear because they said, we'll free you if you say this. And um, I knew in the past other political prisoners had been forced to make confessions as well. I'd seen some of their confessions televised on Iranian state-run TV. And afterward, many of them had been released and some of them had recanted their lies. So I thought, this is the way things work here. The authorities want to get a false confession, use it for propaganda purposes or to further their political goals. And um, I'm, I'm not a hero. I just have to do what other political prisoners have done before me, and then I'll get out, I'll go somewhere safe, and I'll recant my lies. But I felt ashamed of myself from, from the moment that I made that false confession. Your father's Iranian, your mother's Japanese. You were raised in Fargo, North Dakota. How did that happen? <laughs> my father, you know, all the Iranian, Japanese, and Americans live in Fargo, North Dakota, <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> my, my mother got a job at the VA Medical Center in Fargo, so we all followed her there from New Jersey. Roxana Sabiri is our guest. Phone numbers are up on the screen if you'd like to participate in our conversation. First up for her comes from so South Lake Tahoe, California. Please go ahead, South Lake Tahoe. Yes, hi. Uh well, I, I thank you for, for showing this topic, and ma'am, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Iran-Iraq war. Do, do you remember that in the late 80s? Yeah, I was living in America at the time, but I've read and heard about it. Okay, um, I guess one of the reasons that Iran, uh, you know, the local police are so paranoid about everyone being spies because during that war, the United States secretly was actually backing both Iran and Iraq. Did you know that? Yeah, I, I know about the Iran-Contra affair. Right. Well, I mean, there were, so, uh, there were secretly... Caller, 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 what's your point? Get to your question. This question is, have you ever considered that right now in Iran that the United States government is secretly backing the government in power and those trying to overthrow it? Just consider that. Have you right. considered that? Thanks, Colin. Thank you. Who represents American interests in Iran? The Swiss Embassy. Okay. Did they? What? What was their role in your release? The Swiss ambassador uh, made several high-level contacts in Iran, and she pushed for my release. And also, the Swiss president, in a meeting with President Ahmadinejad, the Iranian president in Geneva during my imprisonment also um, pushed for my release. What about the U.S. State Department? Uh, the U.S. State Department, I know Hillary Clinton uh, made calls to my release and also various staff members also tried to help my parents as well. Um, I actually found out about um, 
Hillary Clinton calling for my release one day when um, you know, I had I, I told you about the false confession. I eventually recanted it while I was still in prison because I felt so guilty about it. And I told myself, I don't want to be freed upon lies. I would rather stay in prison and tell the truth.